My name is Kathy McQui and I uh, work with a group called We the People North Shore, which has been working for a little over six years on trying to get Congress to send an amendment to the states to address Citizens United and also the rights that have been given to corporations that belong to humans from the Constitution. So we have monthly meetings and, and we also have just one flyer out there. You don't need more than one, right? So I welcome you all to come to one of our meetings and learn a little bit more once this is over. Good evening and welcome to a talk, a presentation by Jeff Clements on a proposed amendment to the U.S. Constitution to address Citizens United. My name is Kathy Leonardson and this is Lee Mondale. We're from the Marblehead League of Women Voters and we are one of the co-sponsors of this evening. The others are uh, Salem State University's Political Science Department and Bates Center for Public Affairs. We the People of Massachusetts, North Shore, and a group called American Promise. And of course we want to thank Salem State for the beautiful facilities this evening. Hello everybody. The League of Women Voters has studied the problem of money in politics for the last couple of years. There are three pathways for change in our government. Change in the law via legislation, change in the judiciary as to how laws are interpreted, and change through a constitutional amendment. At this time, the League of Women Voters has not taken a position on the amendment that will be discussed tonight. But we have an open attitude towards a possible amendment, and we welcome the opportunity to learn from the presentation. Please note that the League is nonpartisan with respect to candidates and parties, but after in-depth study, we do take positions and we do advocate for issues. Jeff is a constitutional lawyer, and he's the author of a book called Corporations Are Not People, Reclaiming Democracy from Big Money and Global Corporations. He did see some out there, and I actually bought one, and I think he has some just for sale for others as well. He's the co-founder of Free Speech for People, a national, nonpartisan, not-for-profit campaign to strengthen American democracy. He's also the founder of Whaleback Partners, LLC, which provides sustainable financing to businesses in the local agricultural agriculture economy. He was a partner in a major Boston law firm and served as chief of a 100-person public law enforcement bureau in the Attorney General's office in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Jeff has helped to start and been a board member of many nonprofit organizations and businesses. Thanks, everybody. How are you? Good. Good. How's our democracy? Not so good? Huh? All right, so we're going to do something about that tonight. So thank you for coming tonight. I don't know if Kathy had this in the way too long biography there, but some of which is true, but I'm also um, president and co-founder of American Promise, which we launched in January to carry this conversation around the country. It's completely cross-partisan, and I'm going to tell you more about it tonight. Uh, but I want to um, thank and give a shout-out to Ben Gubitz, who many of you saw coming in who helped us get this going, the American Promise, and co-founded it with us, so thank you, Ben. I also want to thank um, Kathy Lequie and the, Le and the folks from We the People Massachusetts who are co-hosting this tonight, and the League of Women Voters, of course. Kathy, thank you, and Lee, thank you. The League of Women Voters of Marblehead. I often have spoken with leagues around Massachusetts, around the country, uh, and the, the, they are a wonderful civic or organization with local um, chapters, as you know. And uh, my grandmother actually was a, a league member in Chicago and uh, was always fired up about it uh, because um, the league, the predecessor, right before the League of Women Voters was founded, got her and many women the right to vote uh, with the 19th Amendment. And I think it's very fitting that we are now here as the country needs another constitutional amendment to make sure we keep this American promise that we're all equal citizens, that we all govern ourselves, uh, with the 28th Amendment that does, in many ways, I think the same thing. Um, it's not about 
whether everyone can vote regardless of their gender. It's not about whether everyone can vote regardless of uh, their race. It's not about whether we eliminate the poll tax so people can vote regardless of their ability to pay a tax, which we did with a, the 24th Amendment. Um, it's not about the you know, 18, 19, 20-year-olds voting, which we did with the 26th Amendment. But it is very much about the very same principle that all those other amendments were about, which is that every American has an equal right to participate as a citizen in this country. And it doesn't matter if you're rich or poor. You get one vote, everyone gets it, and we get equal representation. And so what the challenge is for us, our generation, our amendment, this 28th Amendment, is will we keep that promise or are we going to go down the road? We are way deep down already now that says essentially we're not equal citizens. Um, that if you have millions of dollars to put into the system, you're going to get a lot more representation. Um, if you are CEO of a corporation or you run a super PAC, um, you're going to get a lot more representation. Um, that We can't sustain that. So I'm going to talk about a little bit about why we think that an American promise, um, why an amendment is necessary, because there's lots of reform, as we know, that we need in this country. There's a lot of things we, the people have to kind of turn our attention to and, and get working on. But I'd like to share with you our perspective on, on why a constitutional amendment to set the foundation for all the other reforms is absolutely necessary, or we won't be able to move forward as a country in, in, along the trajectory that is the American problem. So what we're actually trying to do as a country, which is protect and, and, and secure another century of democracy. And I often... Um, you know, have asked, because I honestly, I don't know, a democracy in human history that has gone two centuries. You know, the founders of this country, the framers of the Constitution, were obsessed with Rome and how the Republic got lost to tyranny and, and Caesar and so on, Greece. They looked at all the democracies when they were trying to set up the Constitution, and it was always sort of oligarchy, concentrated power that ended up making it succumb and so that's the checks and balances, all the things they did to sort of, you know, address concentrated power. Well, that's what we're facing now. It's concentrated power of wealth being used in the political process. Uh, so that's our struggle now. And I think um, the, that's the sort of bad news I'm going to share at the beginning. And then the good news is going to be how we're going to win this amendment and how it's coming along, what it will do, and then open it up to conversation. So. I went down a little too far down the road because the league always sets me off on that because I think about the 19th Amendment. We've actually done almost 10 amendments since then. So one of the biggest things in this work is, is believing in ourselves because it's hard. You know, you need two-thirds of Congress, three-quarters of the states have to ratify it. People like, obviously, in mean, Congress, we saw what happened today. They're blowing up the filibuster. Literally, I used to say, Congress can't agree when to go to lunch. And I said it as a ridiculous joke. Two days ago, they could not agree when to go to lunch. <laughs> I'm not joking. <laughs> I'm not joking. Senator Al Franken was chairing a hearing. I think you can find it if you want to Google it. You probably won't. It'll depress you. And they were fighting over when to have lunch, and they couldn't decide. So how are we going to get two-thirds of Congress to vote on an amendment? Well, we're going to do it. We the people. Um, and I'm going to tell you how and get your ideas, and your, hopefully you're joining this effort. And I promise you we'll do it, because it was just as hard to get all those other amendments. They're, by definition, it's hard. Everything we've done in this country to go forward has been hard, and we do it anyway. So that's what it's all about, right? Government of the people. I already told you what I'm going to tell you, so that's what I'm going to tell you again. And then we're going to bring back sort of this national story of the amendment, how we win, to what is the National Citizen Uprising, and what that looks like here in Massachusetts and how you can get involved starting tonight if you're not already involved, and I know many people here are. Um, so just a bit about American Promise, because I think uh, it, it's, it's important. To, some of the things that we tried to build in to American Promise, all the things that we actually tried to build into American Promise, were specifically to deal with obstacles to winning this constitutional amendment. And one of them is that the country overwhelmingly wants this to happen. If you look at polls, it's in the 80s. If you look when people get a chance to vote, eight more communities in Wisconsin voted on amendment resolutions. It's closing in on 800 cities and towns have passed resolutions calling for the amendment. 
regularly pass 75%, as 200 in Massachusetts have done. In Wisconsin, one was 91%. Janesville, Wisconsin, the hometown of the Speaker of the House, Paul Ryan, uh, 84%. So overwhelmingly, Americans want this, but our politics keep dividing us so that it, people think this is a, some, a liberal issue, not um, something that Republicans support, and that's not true. Uh, but it is true in the Senate, and it's true in the House, that Democrats and independents have voted for this, and the Republicans have not yet gotten on board. So one of the things we try to do is create a home and a place where no matter what else we think, we will not debate you know, all the things that divide us. We will focus on this and nothing else until we win. And so we're creating a home for all Americans to rally around. What did George Washington say? A, 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 an honest flag to which we all can repair. Uh, all honest man, badly mangling that quote, but you know what I mean. A place where we can all rally around to do what's right for the country, no matter what our politics are. So we don't have to agree on anything except we need to do this. So we set out with a great advisory council. We wanted to model Americans coming together to get this done. And asked some people who we know supported it to say, okay, it's great you support it, but now we need you to raise your voice a little bit. Tell the country you support it and have the guts to stand Republican and Democrat side by side and say it. All responded wonderfully. So we have business leaders, faith leaders, politicians, great historians like Doris Kearns Goodwin up there, veterans like Joe Goodwin who served in Iraq and Afghanistan. And then you might remember Governor Mike Dukakis there, but he's right beside Senator Al Simpson, uh, Wyoming conservative Republican, liberal Massachusetts Democrat, sitting, sitting side by side to get this done the great Ellen McGrail, a high school student in New Hampshire. So basically every age, every way, walk of life, every political viewpoint coming together to help us win this. Doris Kearns Goodwin, I want to just mention briefly because she's been so helpful. You know, you all probably know her, the author of so many great American histories. Um, and what's so interesting about her, Pulitzer Prize winner and all that, but if you think about it, what era, eras of history does she focus on? If you watch the Lincoln movie, about the, that was the 13th Amendment, um, it's Abraham Lincoln, post-Civil War, T Teddy Roosevelt, and the era after the Gilded Age and how Americans got through that. Uh, and then Lyndon Baines Johnson, who she started her career actually working with in the 1960s. If you think about those eras of history that she knows so well, every one of them were what I think of as amendment eras. We do constitutional amendments all throughout our history. It's how we built the country and our constitution. It's how, as I mentioned, women got the right to vote and so much other stuff, election of senators, so much we did by doing this amendment process. And, but four of them happened um, in the 1960s. We sometimes forget that. We think it was sometime long ago. No, it was the 1960s. We did four of them. Eliminated the poll tax. 18, 19, 20-year-olds serving in Vietnam who had no right to vote. We thought, and Americans stood together on this, said, that's not fair. They need a right to vote, and they got the right to vote. The poll tax, as I mentioned, eliminated D.C. residents, District of Columbia residents, having some representation. All those sort of democracy things. The progressive era, we forget that. Teddy Roosevelt, four amendments. I mean, we don't forget, and you probably don't forget, but sometimes we, we don't realize the role of amendments in uh, driving our country forward. So the progressive era, election of senators, I know my kids probably didn't remember that we didn't used to elect U.S. Senators. They were appointed, and Doris Kearns Goodwin, um, well, I won't give it away, it's coming up in a video, you'll see what she says about that. But we the people said, no, we're going to elect the Senators, and we did an amendment, four of them in the, in the Progressive Era, and, and three of them after the Civil War, to end slavery once and for all, to say equal rights, equal protection, due process to guarantee a right to vote regardless of your race. This is how we keep the American promise. And it's so interesting, I think, that she, who knows this history so well, not only sees that we need an amendment or we're going to lose the American promise, she says that we can get it done. And she's seen it done. So we can get it done. And I think, again, that is a big part of what we have to remind each other, because you will go out of this room, and if you go talk to people, or and you say, yeah, I'm working on a constitutional amendment to the U.S. Constitution. We're going to overturn Citizens United. We're going to get money out of politics. We're going to get our democracy working again. And guess what? As a bonus, we're going to heal all these divides and wounds in our country because we're going to do it together and kind of throw the corrupt people out of the 
political process, and they'll say, oh yeah, right, you know, give me some of that drug you're taking or something, <laughs> right? But we are, so, and it's important that we are able to keep doing this even when the naysayers and the cynics are saying, no, it can't be done. So, I, I often uh, remember what Doris Kearns Goodwin says and what she knows about Americans and American history. So let's get started a little bit deeper, if you don't mind. Why do we need an amendment? Why, what's, why a constitutional amendment? Well, look at this quote. This is the Citizens United decision that that refers to. And that decision in 2010 struck down the Bipartisan uh, Campaign Act. And that is the McCain-Feingold Act. You might have heard of, of it phrased that way, because McCain and Feingold, Democrat, Republican, led getting together to say, we got to get money out of politics. And it closed a loophole that, and made corporate money and union money to have to be out of elections in a 60-day period around federal elections. So it was not dramatic, it was, but it was helpful. And it was challenged, and the court struck it down as a violation of free speech rights of corporations, unions. And then they went on and said, oh, and by the way, all those cases that limited money based on the equal rights of Americans, or all those cases that said we can have campaign finance laws uh, to stop systemic corruption of our system, we're going to overthrow all those and say that violates the free speech rights of anyone who has billions of dollars to spend. And so basically they bulldozed the traditional American protections against money overwhelming our system. And some of the laws they struck down went literally back a hundred years. The, the McCain-Feingold line about corporations went back to 1907 in the progressive era. And unions, union money was added in 1948. Nobody ever thought it was a free speech violation. Um, the idea of limiting money in, in our elections to protect our rights as citizens um, is fundamental to our system. The Supreme Court wiped it all out in Citizens United 5-4. So that's Jim Leach saying, this is pushing us into corporatist oligarchy, exactly what the founders feared. And I sometimes say, I've given it away by saying it's Jim Leach, I ask people, you know, squint and guess who that is, and with that kind of rhetoric, you think, oh, it must be Bernie Sanders, looks a little like Bernie, right? And, and, and Jim Leach is a Republican from Iowa. He's a law professor now, since he left Congress after three decades of service as a Republican in Congress. Law professor at the University of Iowa, which is probably why he refers to genetically modifying our democratic DNA, big farm state. And, you know, people like Jim Leach, sober, serious Republicans talking about corporatism and oligarchy. This is real, my friends. This is a, a real crisis when people like Representative Leach are trying to rally the country, saying we are going into oligarchy. And, he, and he's quite right, um, and has been a real um, help on our advisory council. And this is why, when he says oligarchy and corporatism, what he means by that is, is the, the squeezing out of the voices and the ideas and the rights of all Americans. So $40 billion is roughly the money that's flowed into elections since Citizens United bulldozed our laws keeping it out. 40 billion, it's sort of hard to get your head around, you know, what's 40 billion? We've only had 2012, 2014, 2016. So we've basically got three election cycles, 40 billion total, roughly, because there's so much dark money now that nobody can really get a handle on where the money's coming from, but roughly 40 billion. And the next number, though, is the key. 70% of that money, almost all the money, comes from less than one-half of one percent of the population. So if 300 million Americans were putting a little money into the system, getting it to 40 billion, it wouldn't be a problem. The problem is almost all the money comes from very few people. So the last election, 2016, the most expensive in world history, any election, anywhere, anytime, three billionaires alone, three people, put in 200 million dollars into the election. Uh, and so that's why it's, it's oligarchy, because it's not just that the money is, uh, it's not civic. You don't spend $200 million on an election because you know, you're gonna get your name on the Capitol and you're just trying to be a good citizen. These are battles, just like in Saudi Arabia or Russia, of factions of powerful, wealthy interests. 
and they're fighting it out, and they're pouring money in to fight each other, and then we're the spectators who go and vote and hope somehow we're represented, but the money is a, is a battle of wealthy factions. That's why that man feels silenced and protests with a dollar bill over his mouth. Money has silenced him. That's why that woman is emphasizing this isn't about whether you're wealthy, it's not about class warfare. She doesn't mind them being rich, she says. I mind you buying my government. And, and that's what we're working against. That's the corporatist oligarchy that Jim Leach is referring to. And I've mentioned billionaires a few times, and that is part of it. And, but the corporations and unions piece, when the court eliminated the restrictions on, on the spending of money by economic interests in our campaigns, that was the idea of that, those laws, was, look, these are good things in the economy, but they shouldn't leverage that economic power into political power, because that hurts the rights of everybody else. Just three examples, because you often don't hear of corporate money in elections going directly in. Target learned the lesson that corporations don't. Americans don't like this, believe it or not. For some reason, we are bothered when you know, corporations spend millions and millions of dollars to elect our candidates and you know, turn them into representing them instead of us. So they run it through front groups. Target put money in, in the Minnesota governor's election and ended up with a national consumer boycott <laughs> against them, and they apologized profusely and said, we'll never do it again. So what they do now instead, these corporations, is they run it through front groups. That's the super PACs that all have the nice names, like Americans for Apple Pie and things like that. And the other tr more traditional ones are the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, and I'm being cross-partisan. It's a cross-partisan problem as well as a cross-partisan solution, the Democratic Governors Association and the Republican Governors Association. Just those three examples, $700 million in the last you know, same time period, last few years, into our elections, and it is coming into Massachusetts, I guarantee you. There was the governor's race last time, very expensive, tons of the money, and if you go and look, where did that money come from? Governor's Association. Well, where did they get it, <laughs> right? It's a, there's a non-profit groups, the Governor's Associations. I've been to some of these meetings of these associations. They're filled with lobbyists, and it's as if they're gathering to you know, learn how to be better governors. <laughs> they're not. They're meeting with lobbyists, and they're raising money from the corporations, and then they spend that money in the election. And some unions. Don't we, you know, especially Republicans, are, I often hear, of concerns about union money. And, and that's legitimate. That's why, since 1948, it's been regulated in elections. And so you see some unions up there, too, among the, among the top spenders. Um, so that's, that's the problem. That's why we need the amendment, because what the Supreme Court tells us, if you think this is a problem, $40 billion from a handful of people and corporations and unions, um, and that it might be corrupt in our system, and you want to do something about it, the Supreme Court says, no, you're not allowed to do something about it. That would violate the Constitution. It would violate the First Amendment. That's what the Supreme Court and Citizens United said. So, there's two ways to fix it when the Supreme Court makes a mistake, which almost everybody thinks that decision is a mistake, except the Supreme Court. Um, five of them, anyway, um, as of today, probably. Two ways to fix the Supreme Court when it goes wrong. One is the Supreme Court wakes up one day and usually with a huge push from the American people to say we made a mistake and we we're going to fix it. Example, Brown versus Board of Education overturning Plessy versus Ferguson saying segregation is not constitutional and saying we're going to desegregate our schools. That was Brown versus Board of Education example. Unfortunately, a very, very rare example of the Supreme Court saying we made a mistake, we're going to fix it. The other way, and the only other way, is a constitutional amendment. Eight times the American people have said, you guys blew it, we're going to fix it. The Supreme Court in the Dred Scott case shamefully and famously said, African Americans have no rights. I'm quoting that the white man is bound to respect. That's in our Supreme Court reporters. Not ever overturned by the Supreme Court. Said, said African Americans will never be citizens in this country and slavery is going to be a national institution forever. That's almost literally their words. And uh, the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment and 700,000 dead Americans in the Civil War overturned that decision. 
the, we forget the Supreme Court said women have no right to vote. Uh, Minor versus Happersat, a case in the late 1800s. Um, interestingly, under the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment, women had said equal protection, sounds like maybe we ought to have a right to vote, right? No, they said, and corporations said equal protection, that means we can't be taxed in different states, right? And the Supreme Court said, oh yes, that's right. You're equal. So corporations were persons with rights under the Equal Protection Clause before women were. And it took the 19th Amendment to fix that. So the Supreme Court struck down the income tax. You know, that's kind of weird, isn't it? The income tax, I mean, none of us like taxes, right? <laughs> but, but we want to think that there's a, a, a constitutional right not to pay taxes, which is what the wealthy argued. In, in the early part of the 20th century, and the Supreme Court agreed income tax violated the Constitution. That was overturned with an amendment. So the Supreme Court gets it wrong a lot. The way to fix it is with an amendment, and that's what we have to do, because they're not going to fix it themselves. I used to have people tell me, oh, we'll just elect Hillary Clinton, and we'll get a new Supreme Court justice, and they'll fix everything. We don't have to do this. Well, that strategy isn't viable anymore. I didn't think it was viable at the time either, because going to another five to four decision and just fighting back and forth over this um, isn't the way to do it. It's our responsibility to fix this, I think, forever, which is what the 28th Amendment can do. So that's just a sort of cheat sheet. If you want any of those things, reasonable limits in election spending, limits on corporations or unions, and so on, amendment gets, gets us them, no amendment doesn't. Okay? So, the less wonky way to say we need an amendment is this, right? We know, and I don't need to tell you what to think about our current political system. I think we all have our own things that we feel like, this is broken. Why can't we just solve some of these problems? They're not getting solved. And they won't get solved until we get some representation of the people back in and some reasonable politics, which our amendment can do. So there's other examples, but you know, it could be national debt, you know, $20 trillion in debt, this country right now. It could be you know, right, left, it doesn't matter. We can't fix our problems right now. And so the, the future one, those are some kids I saw walking by in Washington. That sign says equal justice for all. And they're high school kids. And I just snapped that picture. Because that, to me, sort of summed it up. Because if we do our job in these next couple of years, few years, they will be the beneficiaries, right? I mean, this is, it's going to take some time to fix this and turn this around. But the, just like the people who came before won amendments for us and our future, that's who we're doing this for. There's lots of good reforms. You might have been thinking about other ones. I do too. Whether it's term limits, redistricting, lobbying reform, transparency, all kinds of good ideas. Disclosure. That, this does not mean we don't need to do those. It doesn't mean that the amendment is the only thing and if only we do the amendment everything will be fixed. No. But what I think about it as is this house. right? The amendment is the foundation. The constitutional foundation of everything we want to do in this country, if we get the constitutional foundation right, we can build the roof and the walls and the windows on top of it. If we don't get it right, whatever else we try to do will look like that house. It'll crumble. Because it won't have a strong foundation of political equality and being able to stop corruption in, the, in, the, in our political system. Equal rights for Americans to be represented equally and Dealing with systemic corruption requires the amendment, and that's the foundation for anything else. So, um, long way of saying we need the amendment. What would the amendment do? Um, it would basically give us back the power to limit money and spending in elections. It would make sure our human rights are guaranteed under the Constitution and not have them sort of taken away and turned against us by the biggest global corporations. Um, and so it, 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 it well, says Citizens United is wrong and lets us get big money out of politics and get people back in. Uh, so, how do we do it now? We need the amendment. Um, we know what it can do. How do we win? Well, we need three things at least. We need national consensus, as I said, under Article 5 of the Constitution. That's the amendment provision. And Article 5 says we need two thirds of Congress, and then it gets ratified by three quarters of the states. There's also a provision for a convention call, um, which we can talk about, uh, but if, whether it's a convention, which we haven't had before, or Congress proposing the amendment, either way, it has to go through 38 states to get ratified. It's hard by design. It's not supposed, you're not supposed to amend the Constitution every day, but it's sort of like the, in case of emergency, break glass. 
and you get the key out and you fix things. That's what Article 5 does. It's a, in case of emergency, and we've used it 27 times successfully. So to do it, though, we need national consensus. It's not the way, you don't get an amendment with something that only half the people agree on. You need everybody, almost, to agree on it. And then you need to take that agreement of the people and turn it into the kind of overwhelming power that the old corrupt structure can't stand against anymore. And just a, an example of that, women getting the right to vote, uh, or election of senators, those two amendments, I guarantee you there were people saying, yeah, right, you're going to get that two-thirds of an all-male unelected Senate to pass an amendment to give women the right to vote and to make them go out and face the people in elections. It's never going to happen. And it took a long time, but it did happen. So the trick is to take the consensus that it needs to happen and then turn it into the kind of political power that can actually um, make Congress do this. And so that gets to number three, which is how we get the political power. So we get this new political power of 80 plus percent of the people coming together if it's not sort of this top-down controlled thing, but if we start doing it in our communities everywhere, just like we've already been doing. You know, we have 800 cities and towns where Americans have come together to do this, as I mentioned. 18 states have called for this through, the, through amendment resolutions. We need this to be everywhere, all the time, in our local communities, so eventually our Congress, and eventually I mean like this year, next year, our members of Congress can't come back home without people saying, what are you doing to get the 28th Amendment out of Congress? And they'll say, oh, I support that, especially in Massachusetts. Our good friends in Congress will say, I support that, it's great. Then the next question is, what are you doing to get people of the other party on board? You know, we need everybody. We need two-thirds of Congress. It's great you support it, but we need you to do more. Um, that will happen, and it's starting to happen, thanks to so many people in Massachusetts, here and elsewhere, but we need it everywhere. So, uh, personally, I'll be in Kansas City tomorrow, Tulsa on Monday, and Fort Lauderdale on Thursday, um, but there's only one of me, and one of Ben, and one of Kathy, and one of Nick there, who many others in this room are doing a lot of work. Um, so we need lots more people doing lots more things, and that is how we will win. National consensus, turn it into political power, build this everywhere in every city and town in America. And I have to tell you, I go everywhere, Tulsa, you name it, there's nowhere in this country where I've gone, and it's been a lot of, a lot of places now, where this is a hard sell. <laughs> you know, this is red state, blue state, rural, urban, it does not matter. I mean, so don't disappoint me in Q&A and say that this is all wrong as you'd be the first. Most rooms in America, people think, We're, sign me up, how do I help? And that's, that's really good news. So, national consensus, let me through, run through these. Um, we have it. Those are polls every year. Since Citizens United was decided in 2010, most years, every few years. It's unwavered, no matter how much we argue and fight about lots of things. America, uh, independents, Republicans, Democrats, all Americans, more or less, mostly agree on this. It goes anywhere, you know, down to 60s, high 60s, and then it bounces back up, but it's basically in between, you know, 68 and 80 percent, over and over again. We know it's true because of the ballot initiatives, the cities and towns I mentioned, and the states, where we regularly get those really high votes. So, how do we take that national consensus and turn it into political power? Well, we have to acknowledge it and talk about it, and then do things that are hard, like work with people who we don't agree with. So that's another thing we at American Promise are trying to do. This is our national conference, and I hope you'll come to the next one. This was in October 2016. So it was a month before the election, and we had two members of Congress who were Democrats, two who were Republicans, on the stage talking about how they're going to get the 28th Amendment through Congress a month before the election. And you know that ought to be news in a country that oh, media is always telling us we're really divided and Congress doesn't agree on anything. Well, there's Congressman Walter Jones from North Carolina. I'm shaking his hand because we gave him an award for, he's a Republican, conservative Republican from North Carolina, uh, supports the 28th Amendment and works, and works with a lot of Democrats and not very many Republicans. So it's a little bit of a Profile and Courage Award. And Jim McGovern, our own Jim McGovern from Massachusetts, um, who worked with Walter Jones, Don Edwards from Maryland, and Jim Leach, who I mentioned. So we have to actually work and exercise our muscle, as 
as, as citizens in a democracy, not just um, advocates for our own politics. And it does take an effort that we're going to keep doing. And mostly, um, it's up to us, not Congress. That bottom picture is what it's all about. That citizen deliberation. We, we create spaces where Americans can come together to work on this, regardless of their political viewpoint. So we call it Citizen Cafe, and we do trainings and help people work on this together in their community. And in real life, which is less vitriolic than online, turns out actually most Americans are pretty polite to each other face to face. You'd never guess if you're on Facebook or some of the places where the political debate goes on. But if you, do you have a town meeting here in uh, Salem and there's city councils, town meeting? Anyway, we have town meeting in Concord still, and I love it because it's just democracy in action where people listen to each other, they hear each other, they don't agree, but then resolve and find a way to move forward. And it's really exciting when you see it happen around a big issue like this. So it's happening, we're helping to make that happen. So that's national consensus, we got it. We're starting to build the kind of political power that can't be denied, and this is how we do it. As I said, local and everywhere. So that's just some examples, Ypsilanti, Michigan, Concord, Tampa Bay, Washington State. Joe Goodwin is in there for inspiring service. He gives us an amazing talk about uh, after 9-11 when he ran, literally ran straight to a recruiting station, joined the army um, after coming out of Harvard. and. Uh, served in Iraq and Afghanistan, and what he learned there, and this is why it relates to this kind of cross-partisan thing I'm work, work, working on, uh, we're working on, and I was talking about, is that in, in the service to the country, people come from everywhere. So he served with people from all different states, all different political viewpoints, all different races, and it just ha it melts away all those differences because you're serving the country. And he gave this amazing talk at our conference that that's what this amendment fight is about. Um, that's why he's on our advisory board. It's about Americans getting back together to serve the country uh, by putting the country back on a constitutional footing for our democracy. So there's a short video on the amendment process. should look to history and realize, even if they feel this is very difficult to pass an amendment to fund New States of the United, we've passed amendments before. Sometimes I hear people say, oh, constitutional amendments, we can't do that. It's something they did, you know, back when they wore powdered wigs in the 1700s, and that's just wrong. When the public gets mobilized, almost anything can happen. Lincoln once said, with public sentiment, anything is possible. Without it, nothing is possible. They needed money, and there wasn't enough money in the federal government coffers to deal with some of the new legislation. So the income tax amendment was critical, not only for the progressive legislation to enforce it, but for the New Deal. The foundation of the New Deal was possible only by the federal government having an income tax. And then you had a series of corrupt legislators who were being bribed by businessmen to get a seat in the Senate. So one senator would be called the coal senator, another guy would be the oil senator, another guy was the beef senator. So the 17th Amendment is passed, making direct election of senators. Well, sometimes the people may be wrong. <laughs> you know, in a democracy, you cannot say that everything they're going to do is right. And luckily, we had a self-preserving mechanism where we could have the 18th Amendment ending drinking and the 21st Amendment bringing it back. With the downfall of prohibition being celebrated in real old-time hilarity. So it shows that the people can be wrong and they can right their wrongs. Woman suffrage is a long story of hard work and heartache crowned by And then, of course, you have the 19th Amendment. Years and years of work to get women's suffrage, and it finally culminated not long after this period. So it was a wonderfully fertile period, I think, for people feeling we can change the country. It is a democracy, and it's in our hands.
in the 60s, you had the civil rights movement, and really the, the sense that young people had and, and older people had that we can make a difference in this country, that our public lives really mattered to us. We were citizens in the 60s. We were citizens at the turn of the 20th century. We are actually overdue for a constitutional amendment in this country. Uh, Americans regularly need to pass constitutional amendments in order to renew and refresh, if you will, uh, how we secure that promise of liberty and equality for all Americans. Uh, the Supreme Court gets it vitally wrong many times, such as the Dred Scott case that said African Americans can never be citizens. The Supreme Court decided that women have no right to vote. The Supreme Court decided that there's nothing wrong with a poll tax. The Supreme Court thought that there was nothing wrong with drafting 18, 19, and 20 year olds and sending them to war even though they had no right to vote. All those cases and more were overturned by the constitutional amendment process. Article 5 uh, makes clear, and the founders intended this, that we, the people, have the last word. have targets, and the target is the passage of this amendment, then you can get people to work on that target and the broader argument about inequality of income. Madison said we should do constitutional amendments only on extraordinary occasions, and I think most Americans agree that we now face our own extraordinary occasion. We're getting brainwashed into thinking that we're consumers. But we are citizens of these United States. And we have responsibilities as citizens. And we need to wake up. Because if we don't do something, those responsibilities may be taken away from us. And if we're not watching, it's shame on us. Uh, not only for my generation, but for the next generation. So that we are looking at a United States that is truly a democracy and, and doesn't migrate toward tyranny. Toward, toward the very few making decisions for, for the many. And I think what American history teaches us uh, over and over again is that we actually believe in our American promise of equal citizenship, of human liberty, and our own responsibility. And when asked to step up, Americans step up and do what's right. People are all over the country. That's this, what we're doing now is called this National Citizen Uprising. And the emphasis is on, on citizen and rising up, but uprising doesn't necessarily mean pitchforks and burn it all down. It's a responsible uprising, a citizen's uprising. And it's basically taking this great work that's been done so far to win amendment resolutions in states and cities and towns and amplify it and accelerate it and concentrate it together so that it's, you know, we get to the finish line at the same time all over the country. Um, so what we've had so far is good work, but we have to magnify it and double down on it so that it has the oomph, you know, to get the kind of attention we need this to get in Congress and beyond. So what does the uprising look like? Well, it, I'm going to actually come back to that in just a second. Um, it basically means we, at American Promise, promise, that any American, anywhere in this country, who wants to help, can help. You want to do something, anything, we will help you do it. Um, we don't have to, there's lots of ways to do it without us, and there's lots of great groups that we support and work with, and we the people and others. Um, but basically we are taking this, and knitting this sort of narrative together, and this um, national movement together to say not only can you act wherever you are, but you can connect with other Americans who are acting, and you don't feel like sort of isolated in your town, you're doing a resolution, but you have no idea, does this make any difference? How does this get an amendment passed? Well, now you know, and you can trust that other Americans are doing this where they live, and it will come together into this huge, overwhelming force to get this done. That's what the uprising is about. So it's ballot initiatives in some states, 
It's legislative resolutions in some states. It's more local resolutions. It's using the letter to the editor tools or the contact your legislator tools or the petitioning tools we have. But it's basically wherever we can do something, we want to be doing something as Americans in this work. And so Massachusetts, we have both opportunities because we're a ballot state. 26 states have the citizen ballot. It's a big reform that happened in one of those last eras, the progressive era, didn't used to do this. And our, as Doris Kearns Goodwin described, our Congress and our state legislators were so dominated by corporate lobbyists that people couldn't get anything through and created by pushing for big amendments to state constitutions for ballot initiatives so we could make the laws ourselves on the ballot. We in Massachusetts and 26 states have that. So we're going to have a ballot initiative. Um, Ben's going to come up here and tell you more about it soon. We also have legislative resolutions. Um, so We the People of Massachusetts is leading uh, an effort called We the People Act. And it pushes Congress to get the 28th Amendment out or face a constitutional convention and we'll go around Congress to get the amendment done. And so they can, we can talk about the convention and that aspect of pushing Congress with that kind of resolution, uh, but that's part of the citizen uprising in Massachusetts. And there's things you can do on both of those uh, today, uh, starting today and then moving forward. We're building on strength here. We're not inventing something that isn't already going on. Many of you may know that. But look at Massachusetts. Those are communities that have passed resolutions already. Everywhere. This has been happening in these last five years. Now, some of the problem is many of those were 2012, some were 2014, and what we're trying to do with the uprising is not let it fade away and say, oh, those people who want the amendment, they've gone away, back to business as usual. <laughs> no, it's not. We're not going back to business as usual. We're doubling down. But that's where resolutions have already happened, and it makes a difference. So why do you do resolutions? Where does that come from? Well, you know, some people say, oh, a resolution, that's non-binding, it doesn't actually do the amendment. And I say, you know, the Declaration of Independence was non-binding too, you know? This is what we do, it's what we've always done. We set out the resolve of what we're going to do, and then we make it stick as Americans. And that's what resolutions have always done. All those amendments that didn't have a chance either, Americans did resolutions, 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 until Congress either changed, or the people in Congress changed, and passed the amendment by two-thirds. These make a difference. Look when we started, um, and I, the we is a big we of the whole movement trying to do this. 25 cities and towns had done resolutions. We had one state that passed a resolution. The Senate, there, didn't care. The House had one or two champions. Donna Edwards was one of them. That's why we had her at our conference getting our award. She was the one, the one who first introduced an amendment two weeks after the Citizens United decision. But look at when these resolutions have passed, going on 800, <coughs> that, that's, about, that's a few months old, 740, 18 states. Look what's happening in the Senate and the House. It works. It works. So we have to expand this effort and we'll get to two-thirds. Ballot initiatives are key, uh, th and they prove the lie that the media wants to tell us that we're so divided, we don't agree on anything. Or the big money people will say, oh, that's a Bernie Sanders left wing thing. <laughs> that, you know, don't vote, don't support that amendment stuff. That's some, um, you know, Bernie Sanders, Nancy Pelosi thing. And it's not true. And the ballot initiatives prove it. So in Montana, that's Werner Bertelsen. He's a Republican. He came out of retirement. He'd been the former Secretary of State in Montana. Came out of a retirement in 2012 at 94 years old to campaign for a 28th Amendment ballot initiative with an unusual slogan that I've lived here 94 years and I've never seen a corporation I wanted to dance with yet, but it worked. <laughs> and uh, along with many Montana folks, ranchers, business people, you know, all Montanans, that's why I'd stand with Montanans, they passed the ballot initiative 75%, 25%. Those same voters that day voted for Mitt Romney, and around Mitt Romney, over Barack Obama by 12 or 13 points. It was a red state, and yet 75% voted for this ballot initiative. Uh, that's the kind of thing. That's why we need more of those ballot initiatives. That's how we're going to do it. So what's a ballot initiative? So a ballot initiative is, instead of asking the legislature, or in addition to asking the legislature, passing a law, we can make a law by having a direct vote for the initiative 
on the ballot. That's why it's called ballot initiative. So when you go to vote and you read, you know, one of the initiatives like marijuana legalized in Massachusetts on the ballot. So it's like that. Yeah. So on the amendment, your specific is about the amendment. So on the amendment, the ballot initiative will say, in some states like Montana, there's it could be different in different places, but basically it's a way for voters to say, we want this 28th Amendment, Congress get on it. And so in Montana, they have a sort of Western populism, and they instructed their members of Congress to support the 28th Amendment. Um, it's not clear what happens if they ignore the instruction of the voters, but they instructed. They didn't ask, they didn't demand, they instructed them to do the amendment. Um, in Massachusetts, um, we'll tell you a little bit more about this soon, but what we're trying to do is do something similar in terms of calling on for an amendment out of Congress, but then making it stick. Remember, resolve and then make it stick by creating a citizen commission, cross-partisan, independent, people who support the ballot initiative, the, the 28th Amendment, to stay together and work to hold hearings to gather information about money and politics and corporate powers and Citizens United in Massachusetts to sort through the couple of different versions of the amendment in Congress and then to report out to the people on how are we doing? Are there our congressional delegation? Are they following our instructions and supporting the amendment? Is our governor advancing the amendment? Are we in Massachusetts getting ready for ratifying this amendment after it comes out of Congress so that we have rapid ratification? So it creates a citizen commission to kind of carry the energy of the 28th Amendment forward even after Election Day and keep, keep the people engaged in making sure we, we do our job as citizens. So that's what we're looking at. Um, and there's an approval process for the language and things like that. But we're going to be ready to roll it out in May and that gets us to next steps. Um, Ben's going to come up and tell you exactly what you can do to join the citizen uprising. But you can, we need 700 and something volunteers to gather signatures to put it on the ballot. We need over, Ben, 80,000 signatures? Yeah, we'll need about 100. 100,000 signatures all over the state. So we, we're, we're recruiting volunteers. And I, I won't do this to you, but I, so I had the exact number and I'd say, we need 775 volunteers, and someone threw up their hands. 774, because they were going to volunteer, and someone else would do that. So we can do that if you want, but we, we're really already getting people signed up to volunteer. Um, and the We the People Act and the legislature, there's things you can do. Um, and uh, all of that's part of the citizen uprising. So we're going to launch this with two big meetings. May 20th in Worcester, Congressman Jim McGovern has already agreed to speak. More convenient to you folks here probably is Boston on May 13th. We are not yet confirmed our main speaker, but we will soon, and you'll find out more about this, but May 13th in the morning, and it's not about coming and listening to the speaker, we're gonna have some entertainment in the speaker, but then we're gonna be doing trainings and signing up to volunteer and get out and get this done and connect with each other and go out ready to move this forward. So two big meetings. Um, I'm going to ask Ben to come up now and tell you more about it and what you can do. And if we do it, we'll be like these other Americans celebrating amendments. And what's so interesting about these great pictures is there's not a politician in the bunch. <laughs> They're all Americans, citizens, and politicians are Americans too. They're not politicians. They're just citizens who did the thing that pe people would say can't be done. And they got to celebrate their amendment. My favorite is, happy days are beer again, when they repeal prohibition. So I've been promising a beer for everybody when we celebrate the 28th Amendment and put our country back on a sound footing. So thanks so much. Who's ready to save democracy? OK. Most people in the room here are ready to save democracy, which is great. So, uh, so as Jeff mentioned, there are a number of ways to get involved with the Citizen Uprising right here in Massachusetts and know that um, this is happening in towns and cities and communities and states all over the country, so you're not alone. Um, so one of the things that we want to do is we want to um, do the ballot initiative that I'll tell you a little bit more detail out in a minute. Um, but the, the We the People uh, bill, the We the People Massachusetts group also has some really good work to be done around that and contacting your elected officials. And Kathy, perhaps you can uh, remind me, I believe it's House Bill 1927 and Senate Bill 379. If you want to write that down, I believe that's right. 
If you go to AmericanPromise.net on our website, uh, there's a way to, for you to look and see who your elected official is. You can write your elected official. There's contact information. If you plug in your zip code, you'll be able to find who your state rep is, who your state senator is, etc. There's a little script in there for you if you need it to talk about um, why we need this reform. So feel free to do that. And then the other thing is the ballot initiative that Jeff had mentioned. Um, you know, we only get a few of these questions every election cycle on our, on our ballot, right? Last cycle, I think it was four questions. The cycle before that was maybe only five questions. We intend for the 28th Amendment to be one of those questions on the ballot in 2018. It's no easy feat to get on the ballot, and it's that way for a reason, right? Um, but we, as Jeff said, we estimate we probably need around 700 statewide volunteers um, to gather about 100,000 signatures, and this is very doable with an all-volunteer effort. Contrary to, contrary to what you might hear is that you need paid signature gatherers and this and that, not the case. I think that we can get this done with an all-volunteer effort. One of the ways to sign up is by filling out this participation form, which I think I got in the hands of everyone as you were walking in today. This is gonna let us know how you wanna be involved in the citizen uprising. So I'm just gonna walk you through this real quick. So the citizen uprising core team, okay? This is what we're hoping folks will join. Um, we are having core team national conference calls, which are the second Saturday of every single month which means we have one coming up this Saturday, where we have guest speakers to provide more information and background on the issue. There's training on specific issues. The last two months we've done letter to the editor training. Now we'll be starting talking about grassroots lobbying and we'll have special trainers on. And then there'll be actions coming out of these um, calls and we'll encourage people to gather together in their communities, in groups to join the calls and get into action and support each other in that action after. So you can let us know that you want to be a part of that core team by filling this out here. That's the first checkbox. And the core team, when we're ready for it, will transition into the army of volunteers that we'll need out on the streets collecting signatures. Um, it's funny, in Massachusetts, uh, we have a relatively short period of time to gather signatures. It starts um, in September and we only have until about November. Uh, to do this. Unfortunately, some states you get two years. Well, in Massachusetts, we get a little bit under three months, and that's okay. We're going to get it done. Uh, and then there's the Civic Courage program underneath that, which is basically starting an American Promise Association. And to start an American Promise Association is a little bit different than a core team, right? You can kind of just declare yourself a core team member, hop on the conference calls, gather together in a group for these national conference calls. If you want to start an APA, that's a little bit different. An APA is also shorthand for American Promise Association. And basically, there is a little bit more structure of support when you start an American Promise Association, okay? It starts with a launch meeting, which would be somewhat similar to this, except there would be a training, and there would be like a four-part new group training series. And again, I'm happy to tell people more about this. And we do hope that everyone will get involved in some way, some form or another. Any way that you want to get involved is appreciated. Um, we're going to do this thing, and I think that uh, you'll be surprised uh, at the power that we can bring to this movement right here in Massachusetts.